Society was focused upon the quick acquisition of wealth and the accumulation of property. The role of women was suppressed to that of property. A wife was the property of her husband, daughters were the property of their fathers, etc. And so, of course, fashion responded with a very doll-like, infantilized look. Like this. The waistline drops, but not all the way down to the waist. This is not on pier, but it's certainly not at the waist, is it? It's about halfway up, giving a very childlike uh, look to the torso. And please note the ankle revealing skirts. But unlike in the late 1700s, these shorter hemlines were not about sexiness or flirtation or anything Rococo. They simply added to the childlike, doll-like look of the 1830s. And uh, successfully, how weird this all is. Here we have it again. Look at those sleeves. We will discuss those sleeves in a second. The nouveau riche were living large, so the silhouette responded. Take a look at that silhouette. It is so wide. It's so large. And there it is, my goodness. This was about living large. This is about showing your wealth or the wealth of your husband or dad on your body. Okay, let's talk about these extraordinary sleeves. They have a name, and we still use this word today. They are called gigo sleeves. Gigo sleeves. Please do not call them gigot sleeves. Never say gigot. Gigot should never enter the picture. Gigo sleeves. And as I'm sure you've guessed, it comes from the French. It is short for gigo d'agneau. Gigo d'agneau, which is leg of lamb. Want to know why they were called uh, gigo sleeves? Well, that's a leg of lamb. And you can see an actual leg of lamb really echoes the shape of these extraordinary gigo sleeves. How were they achieved? How did they keep this shape? Well, by use of something called sleeve plumpers. There we go, sleeve plumpers. These were sacks filled with a light downy sort of feather that were attached to the corset to keep sleeves puffy so that they would hold their extraordinary shape. And this is an extraordinary shape. Got to give it that. These were big sleeves. Adding to the doll-like look was this uh, large fichu that covered the shoulders entirely and was called a pelerine. Take a look. Look at that dress and pelerine on the right. Okay, we have reached the moment. The moment where I can reveal what I consider to be the most dog-like, ugly dress in this whole course. It's got to be this. I hate this era. This uh, little moment in the 1830s when women dressed like this. It is the worst, as far as I'm concerned. Maybe some of you love it. I am sure Marc Jacobs adores all this. But mm -mm, this is not for me. And there is a contemporary rendering uh, of the pelerine. Looks a bit better there, doesn't it? But still kind of ugly. Needless to say, I am sure you have guessed that adornment and embellishment equaled wealth. Look at these fashion plates. So much lace, so many ribbons, so many flowers and roses and feathers and this and that. That the more crap you could put Onto your attire, the more fashionable you were. Headwear. Bonnets were deep brimmed. They had these very deep, very large funnel like brims. Like that. They made the head very large, which again added to this childlike look. This really was an era when we see women reduced to infants um, without a mind of their own. 
But not only did these big bonnets with the deep brims add to the over-like, childlike and doll-like appearance, but the deep brim brims protected women from seeing the ugly and awful realities of the industrial age. They were like blinkers on a horse. But also, it stopped the poor from seeing her. Right? This little doll-like woman protected from the gaze of the poor and impoverished. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, remember. Always keep that in mind when you think about the 19th century. Again, you won't be surprised to learn that hair in this era was again very doll-like and very uh, embellished. Lots of ornaments, lots of ringlets, flowers, feathers, ribbons. The more stuff you could get into your hair for evening, the more fashionable and the wealthier you were. And this is what it looked like in real life. It's kind of extraordinary, isn't it? So, <laughs> we're going to have fun with this. Let's do an anatomy. All right, there she is in her underpinnings. Corset, pantalettes, and then this, a crin petticoat. Let's not start calling it a crinoline yet. Crin is horsehair. So this was a thick uh, petticoat that was made of a textile that incorporated horsehair to make it very stiff so it would hold the shape of the gown. A crin petticoat. Then, of course, she'd have her sleeve plumpers. Then these flat little ankle boots, over which went her gown, over which went her massive pelerine, and then her massive bonnet. Well, this is okay, but you know what? It's still way too minimalist for the 1830s. This person's husband or dad hasn't made that much money, surely. Wait, they have. Let's make her fashionable. The more ribbons, the more artificial flowers that we add to her attire, and the more doll-like we can make her look, the better. Now she's fashionable. I know this might look utterly ridiculous, but then take a look at this contemporaneous fashion plate and you see it's not ridiculous at all. This is how women dressed. Fashionable women, wealthy women, the nouveau riche in the 1830s. It strikes me always as being very odd that in the mid-19th century, women really were cast as these dim-witted, decorative little childlike dolls, when in 1837, the most powerful person, the most powerful person in the world, was an 18-year-old girl. This 18-year-old girl. Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria was crowned in 1837. She had a very long reign, as you can see. She died in 1901. So, before we go further, I would like to make an important point, not only to you, but to the world in general. Unless you are talking about something that happened in the time period of Victoria's reign, 1837 to 1901, it ain't Victorian. Don't call Edwardian things Victorian. Don't call Regency, Regency things Victorian. I want the world in general to stop calling things Victorian that aren't Victorian. The 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s, the 1880s, the 1890s, that is Victorian. That is Victorian. Anything before that, if we're talking in terms of the... Uh, 19th century is Regency. If you're talking about the uh, 10 years or so after her reign, then that is Edwardian. Victorian, please. It is for this period.
period. So now that I've got that off my chest, let's talk about Victoria. What an unusual person. All right, when she was born, her uncle, the Prince Regent, was the ruler of the British Empire. And strangely, Victoria didn't grow up as a child and young teenager in the way you might expect. She was sort of um, shepherded off to a little seaside town where she grew up in a perfectly nice house, but it wasn't a palace. She lived there with her mum and with a governess and, you know, a couple of modest servants. And she was really brought up like a relatively normal Regency child. Behaviour, good behaviour reigned. She was certainly no tyrant and she wasn't treated like a princess. This is very unusual. She was really just treated like a wealthy, aristocratic little girl. She was raised to be seen and not heard. And we actually know a lot about Victoria's childhood because little Victoria kept a diary. And there's one entry which is so telling and so cute. Um, I guess she wrote it when she was maybe eight or nine and in her diary she said basically that she had been sent to her room because she was quote very 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 extremely extremely very very naughty today so we really get this uh, sense of her being raised as a normal little girl and I think this was a good thing and it shows in her uh, adult life as well on the day of her coronation, as she was in Westminster Abbey, being crowned the Queen of not only England, but that vast British Empire, this very little young lady, and I say very little because she was only four foot eleven, so she was this tiny little person, she was standing there and the Archbishop of Canterbury had her heavy crown in his hand, and he went to a place it on her head and he was an elderly man and it was a very long and stressful day and he stumbled and Victoria instinctively leant forward to help him. This was unusual, this was extraordinary, she acted on instinct and I think it really spoke to the fact that she considered herself really kind of like a regular person. She had an arranged marriage, and her arranged marriage turned out to be one of the great love stories of all history. She married a German, a uh, member of the German royalty, Albert Sax Coburn, and he became her prince consort. He didn't become king, he was the prince consort. She was the queen, Albert and Victoria or rather, Victoria and Albert. They were besotted with each other. She was madly in love with them. She kept a diary throughout her life. And her entries about Albert, they almost, uh, it almost goes into pornography, such as her lust and her love and her obsession for him. But she definitely ruled, and yet... She truly believed that he was her lord and master. And uh, so really, Albert was the decision maker. They had many children, and here is a photograph of Victoria with some of her children. Albert was no slouch. He was a businessman. In 1851, he organized something phenomenal. It was called the Great Exhibition at the Crystal Palace. This enormous structure was made out of iron and glass, and it was called the Crystal Palace. And what the Great Exhibition was, was this. From everywhere in the British Empire and beyond, uh, delegates would come and display what their country had to offer in terms of trade and commerce and goods. It was the world's first 
trade fair. It was the first trade exhibition. And for all of you going into the fashion industry, in your careers, you will have to go to dozens of trade trade shows. Uh, Pret-a-Porter in Paris, Bread and Butter in Barcelona. It goes on and on. Magic in Las Vegas. Well, the first trade fair ever was organized by Prince Albert in 1851, the Great Exhibition. When Prince Albert died, Queen Victoria went into deep, deep mourning. Today, we understand that she had clinical depression when he died. It was almost as if her life stopped. She spent the rest of her life wearing black in mourning for her beloved Albert. And yet I think that uh, uh, the older Victoria, we tend to imagine her as quite a dour person because first of all, she always wore black and uh, she always looked like she was uh, frowning in photographs. But remember, in this era, people had to sit very still to have a photograph taken and to hold a smile <laughs> for a, a long time is painful and difficult. This is a much sweeter picture of an elderly Victoria. Was she a good queen or was she a tyrant? I don't know. I think she was a sweet person. But I think she had absolutely no understanding of what imperialism really meant. Because nobody did. They really didn't. They really didn't understand why taking over India, for example, was a bad thing to do. In fact, I think that imperialists really believed that they were doing good for this country of non-Christians. She did not believe in um, women's suffrage. She did not believe that women should ever have the vote. She believed that women should always obey their husbands and serve them. And she believed that with all of her heart. Maybe because she loved her own husband so much and he was lovely and kind to her. I don't know. She was not an evil person. I think she was a product of her times. But I want to make this point before we move on. What are we seeing here that we have not encountered in the course so far in terms of history? I'll give you a second to think about it. Because when I put this PowerPoint together and I got to this moment, I almost started weeping because I realized how far we'd come and how close we were to the end. Have you figured out what we are seeing here for the very first time? Photographs. We are seeing photographs of old stuff. The mid-19th century saw this new technology, photography, come in, into common use. So from this point on, we can look at real people and not just museum mannequins wearing the clothes we are studying. Wow! <sighs> We've reached a landmark, kids. So let's look at what men wore during this era. This era, which is the height of the industrial revolution. We have this very wasp-waisted look for men. Although the tailcoat was still around, it starts to be replaced by this, the frock coat. But you can see that although everything is very sober, everything is still very much focused up on the neck, isn't it? As I just mentioned, we still have the tailcoat. But we are seeing what here? Trousers! Yes, men are finally got wearing pants. We are seeing trousers. This is a very sensible, sober, business-like look. And you may have known that all of the men in this era are wearing top hats, or toppers, as they were known. And here we have a photograph! Yes, we can do photographs now! of three gentlemen in very high top hats. Top hats, they were nearly always black, 
Why? Fashion is not an island. It's a response. Isn't it? What do these uh, top hats remind you of? Well, they are like the smokestacks, the chimneys, on factories, aren't they? And the big steam funnels on steamboats, and the chimneys on steam trains. Yes. <laughs> top hats completely evoked the Industrial Revolution. I'm not saying that every man who wore a top hat consciously thought, oh, I want to put a chimney on my head, but come on. It's obvious. This is what it was all about. But I really feel compelled as a history teacher and a human being to talk about the children of the revolution. When we think of Victorian children, I think we think of this, don't we? But industrialization in the Victorian era was really fueled by a commodity far more important than coal. It was fueled by children. I'm almost choking up as I show you this uh, little girl here. At the uh, uh, end of the 18th century, when it really looked like a man, we were going to, to turn into an industrial world, the question arose, well, who was going to work? Who was going to work in these factories? And um, William Pitt, who was the Prime Minister of England at the time, I think it was William Pitt, said, we'll have to yoke the children, meaning we'll have to harness children to do the work, alongside grown-ups. And they did. I'm sure you all know about children working in factories during the Industrial Revolution, but they also worked on farms. Adult workers went to work in the factories, meaning that children also worked on the farms. But they worked in, in factories as well, in these terrible conditions. Their little hands were perfect for getting into machinery. In the cotton mills, when cotton became entangled in the machinery, a child's little hand could get in there and fix it and often be chopped off as well. Um, many children lost their hands. Children who worked in the factory were often pulled from orphanages or workhouses. In the 19th century, and the 18th century, but we're talking about the 19th century now, if you couldn't pay your debts, you were put into a prison called a workhouse where you would work off your debt and you would take your children with you or have children inside of the workhouse and sometimes you were in there for years. And so your children would be pulled out of orphanages, if that's not bad enough, a Victorian orphanage. I'm sure you've all seen an adaptation of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, so you know what orphanages were like. You were pulled out of an orphanage, you were pulled out of a workhouse and you were put to work in the factories where you really got no pay and were uh, made to work up to 20 hours a day in these awful conditions fueling these factories with your labor so that factory owners could clothe their children like this Children started working in factories at the age of four or five sometimes. And if they were no good, they were thrown out onto the street. Just compare these two sets of pictures of these children of the revolution. And I'm not saying that it was a picnic for um, middle class children either. This was the age when children, as a concept, was born. But children, rich children, you were to be seen and not heard. Punishment was very, very strict. You rarely saw your parents. You would be cleaned up by nannies and presented to your mother at tea time, where you would have your tea with your mummy. You'd hardly ever see your father. And then you would be removed back to your nursery, 
by your nanny, but still, it's a hell of a lot better than the life that the children on the right had to endure. In the 1840s, social awareness about the awful conditions of industrial workers became fashionable for all of five minutes. Partially thanks to this uh, research uh, finding written by Friedrich Engels called The Conditions of the Working Class in England in 1844. It's a very famous book. Basically, this guy Engels, he did a tour of the industrial north of England and saw firsthand the awful conditions in which uh, factory workers had to work as well as the inhumane conditions of their living quarters, their homes, how poor they were, how cold they were, how dirty it all was. And he wrote a book, an expose, it really is an expose of the nouveau riche and how they treated their workforce. It was published and for a hot, uh, hot minute, there was the sudden social awareness. Charles Dickens as well. This is a photograph of Dickens. He, he uh, really spoke to the underbelly, the uh, dark and hidden side of Victorian life. His novels were serialized and uh, Everybody loved Dickens because Dickens is a wonderful writer. His books are exciting with lots of twists and turns, and they're also very funny at times. But he really was uh, the optic through which the uh, middle classes were made aware of just how disgusting they actually were. And so for uh, a hot second, it was fashionable to claim a social awareness and uh, a care for the workers who were really sort of fueling your lifestyle and your big bonnets. So Engels' study into the dire conditions in factories and Dickens' popular serialized novels threw a spotlight onto the terrible lives of the poor and the underclass. At the same time, upper-class reformers spoke out against poverty and the poor housing of factory workers, miners, etc. You know, nothing really changed and no one really cared, but it was fashionable to pretend that you did, and because fashion is not an island, it's a response. Female attire responded to the social awareness of the 1840s. This is an illustration of a female industrial worker, a factory worker, a poor, impoverished woman of the 1840s. And here is a, a, a still from a BBC costume drama which shows very authentically how industrial factory workers dressed. You see, 19th century factory workers were instantly recognizable by their tightly wrapped shawls. They all had these shawls wrapped or tied very tightly around their bodies because they couldn't afford coats. And the uh, fashionably guilty bourgeoisie responded with this very different silhouette to we saw in the 1830s, isn't it? A very tight sleeve. Oh, we're not so bad. We do care, really. Look how tight our sleeves are. A longer, more modest skirt and the shawl bodice and these tight sleeves and a return to the full length hemline. But it's really the shawl bodice and the tight sleeves I want you to focus upon because this shawl bodice was supposed to evoke, I believe, the shawls worn by factory workers come on. The 1840s was when social awareness and reform was fashionable. I think it's no coincidence. And look how little adornment we're starting to see. 
And here are some more examples of this shawl-like bodice and the tight sleeve of the 1840s. Bonnets, you'll find, become far shallower in the brim. It's like, okay, we, we, we see what's going on. We're aware, we're reformed, but not that reformed. It still blinkers you from the harsh realities, but not as much as you wanted to be blinkered in the 1830s. So I've just made a little note of that for you, that bonnets became shallower. And here are some photographs. Isn't it exciting to see photographs of women in the 1840s with this shawl-like bodice? And you see in the first and the last picture, this shawl-like uh, bodice has been accentuated with this new shape of pelerine, which is really like a shawl now, isn't it? Being draped tightly around the body.